Today we've heard about some terrible events that happened before dinosaurs appear and events that happened just after dinosaurs appear, animals that have converged on dinosaurs and vice versa, and also how dinosaurs grew and their closest relatives. But I want to focus on today just dinosaurs. Where do they come from and what do we know about them? They're one of the most successful groups of vertebrates that we've ever seen. They walked the planet for many, many millions, tens of millions of years. They're really easy to identify in the fossil record in the Jurassic and the Cretaceous. You can go downstairs, look at all these wonderful exhibits, and it's really easy to tell a dinosaur from any other living reptile today, and some of those bigger reptiles like crocodilians that lived at the same time. But this wasn't the case during the origin of dinosaurs. So dinosaurs originated about 230 million years ago, and it was really hard to tell them apart from their closest relatives. How do we diagnose a dinosaur? How do we figure out what are the unique characters to, dinos to dinosaurs that make dinosaurs unique? It's pretty easy, again, when you look at Jurassic dinosaurs. This is an early Jurassic dinosaur, Dilophosaurus, made famous by Jurassic Park. It's much bigger than in the movie. But what we have here is a really nice skeleton that has lots of dinosaur features that are easy to tell apart in the Jurassic from all other animals that aren't dinosaurs. For example, they have a hole in the hip socket. They have lots of characteristics in their upper leg bone or femur that's not found in any other contemporary reptile at the time. They have a specialty joint between their vertebrae, between their pelvis and their forelimbs. They have a unique hand. Some have five fingers, some have three fingers. Birds basically have three fingers fused today. But those characters aren't found in other animals. They have a depression on top of their head for muscles to arch up from the back of their head onto the top of their head, which we don't find in any other animals that lived in the Jurassic and Cretaceous. And they have what we call a bird-like ankle. It works exactly like a bird-like ankle does today, where it just is a simple hinge. So these are all characteristics that we see in dinosaurs in the Jurassic and Cretaceous, but how did they get these characters. They came from their closest relatives. One of the major questions in dinosaur evolution is how did they obtain these characters and which of these characters are actually only unique to dinosaurs? To answer this kind of question, we need to look at a dinosaur family tree. So this is just a family tree and it summarizes what we knew in about the year 2002. Here we have Dinosaurs, so we have our ornithischians, plant-eating dinosaurs, includes animals like Stegosaurus and Triceratops, our sauropodomorphs, the long-necked dinosaurs, and of course theropods, the big meat-eating ones, which eventually become birds. Outside, our closest living relative are crocodilians. They're not very closely related when we include the fossil record. So closer to dinosaurs and birds, are pterosaurs, not true dinosaurs, but close relatives. But we also have these two animals right here. And in 2002, we just had these two species, something called Lagerpaton and Marasuchus. And unfortunately, this is all we had. So to understand how dinosaurs get their characteristics, we rely on these two very fragmentary species known for just before dinosaurs take over the world, sometime in the middle Triassic, maybe a few million years before dinosaurs appear in the fossil record. The problem is these are only about this big. And it's very hard to tell features of an animal when they're really small because sometimes you can't see the features easily or they're embedded in rocks so they don't fall apart when you study them but they were missing important parts like skulls and hands and other parts of their anatomy that are really important to understanding how dinosaurs evolve through time. So this is the picture we had in 2002, but we needed something else to tell a more complete story. That came the next year, 
In 2003, a species called Silosaurus was discovered in Poland and named about that year. This animal had lots of dinosaur characteristics, and this time it was much bigger. This is not a true dinosaur. This is a dinosaur cousin that would have been a little bit bigger than the width of my arms. We could see a lot of those dinosaur characters. We could see things like that ankle that we see in birds only today that are living. We see that special articulation in the vertebrae, the trunk vertebrae of this animal. We see a lot of those characteristics of the femur or upper leg bone that you only find in dinosaurs. But we see a character that no dinosaur has anymore, and it has what we call a closed hip socket. So even though it had lots of dinosaur characters, it didn't have all those dinosaur characters. So I'll get back to this in a second. But what Silosaurus did was tell us a lot more about early dinosaur relatives, those closest cousins. Here's the skull of Silosaurus, and it had no depression on top of its head like all dinosaurs share in the Jurassic, Triassic, and Cretaceous. But what was really surprising is it had a beak. It had a beak like an ornithischian dinosaur. We only thought this beak-like structure was present in plant-eating dinosaurs, but here it is outside of all dinosaurs, and it also had modified teeth suggesting that it was some kind of herbivore. And up to this moment, those two close relatives, Lagerpaton and Marasuchus and other relatives, always suggested that all these early dinosaur cousins were carnivorous. So this was enlightening because it told us we didn't have much of the story. Silosaurus was setting us on a new path. So a bunch of us got together and just started thinking. If this is what Silosaurus is telling us, what's predictable? And what was really neat at the time in the Triassic when dinosaurs were first appearing, all the continents were together in the supercontinent Pangaea. So you could walk from Antarctica basically to the North Pole without crossing any major barrier. So we can map our early dinosaurs from the Triassic, which are these orange stars pretty much all over, with our dinosaur relatives. Again, few and far between in the early 2000s, but we have our Marasuchus and Lagerpaton from down here, and we have Silosaurus from up here. So this essentially told us that there was nothing impeding these animals, and they were living on two different parts of the globe. There should be dinosaur relatives in all these different places if there was nothing impeding them walking around. And that's exactly what we found, and I'll get to that in a second. But what really catalyzed some of our ideas about what makes a dinosaur a dinosaur and how they gain their characters through their closest relatives came from a place in Tanzania. So Ken and Jilzik and Michelle Stalker, who were here and gave talks earlier, we've all gone out to Tanzania because it's the right kinds of rocks of the right age to look for dinosaur relatives. And it's through those dinosaur relatives we can say something about how dinosaurs evolve their features. Here's Tanzania, so we're in East Africa. There's a little bit of a basin in the southwestern part for people that have seen lots of nature shows. All of those nature shows occur up here in the Serengeti. We're really far away from that, so luckily we don't have to worry about too many lions or elephants and things like that. But what we have here is a basin that's filled up with rocks that go through the end Permian. You have your terrible extinction, and then you have the first images of large reptiles that occur sometime in the early to middle Triassic. So we put, uh, went to this area, number one, because it was the right age to look for dinosaur relatives. Two, there were people that already found fossils there, but they hadn't been back since 1963. And three, the fossils that they found were really well preserved and they were partial skeletons. There were no dinosaur relatives there at the time, but we thought this would be our best chance. Now, I'm a Westerner, and I had never been to Africa, so I'm used to scenes like this, 
which are really good to find fossils. Notice there are very few plants. So all of this is rock, and where you have lots of rock, you have lots and lots of fossils. I was imagining this when we got to Africa. What we saw was this. <laughs> this is a picture that Ken took, which I love, and it sums up what we were thinking. Why are we here, and what are we doing in this very, very tall grass? And the local people actually call this grass elephant grass because it hides elephants. That's how tall it is. But we had something up our sleeve, Google. <laughs> Google Maps were remarkably high resolution for this area. And it's a little hard to see on this, but that right there is not a road, it's a footpath. So people have been walking through this area for a really long time and this right here and these kind of gullies are rocks exposed in between the grass. We actually walked on this path maybe 10 times and didn't know all these rocks were here because the grass was so high. But when we went back, we, we put these areas into our GPS, walked directly to them, and every place we found rock, we found fossils. This right here is one of our typical sites, and we're all looking down in the grass. This is a pretty typical picture of paleontologists finding things. You can't see their faces. But this was because Ken picked up a piece of bone about this big. And this bone, which didn't have many features, had one feature that you find in all dinosaurs and their closest relatives. It's a muscle scar. It doesn't really matter what it is. But that one feature told us we had something special. And when we looked down at our feet, we were actually standing in a pile of bones. You couldn't see them. Then we knew where they were there, we, they were there and they were everywhere. So this was in 2007. We went back in 2008, 2012. In 2012, we found a really, really good specimen of a close relative of dinosaurs. This is the night uh, or the day of the discovery with Michelle and I trying to piece together what was found that day. And after maybe 20 to 30 hours of piecing it back together, this is what we came up with. And this is one of the best skeletons of any dinosaur relative that's ever been found. That's one individual. So here is the backside. We have legs. There are pretty much no vertebrae preserved in this animal, but we have the forelimbs and the skull. We named this animal a Coelisaurus and discovered that it's one of the closest relatives of dinosaurs without being a dinosaur. So it had most of those dinosaur characteristics, but it still had that closed hip socket. So we did more work in Africa, and most of the time we were finding fossils up here at the top of the section. And this right here represents about a mile worth of rock. So lots and lots of rock, most of it covered, but we started to look down here a little bit closer to this river, river in a place no one had looked before. So again, we were armed with Google Maps. We went to look for these rocks, we found some, and we didn't find anything. We looked very hard. We were all eating granola bars, kind of saying, why are we doing this again? And we found out that when we counted the number of members of our team around us, we were missing one. Like, okay, who are we missing? We're missing Roger Smith, who's one of the best fossil finders in the world. And usually when Roger Smith disappears, it's a really good thing. <laughs> so we listened in the distance and we heard, I found bone <laughs> and he got closer and closer and he said I found a bone bed and he found one of the first sites in Tanzania from the base of this section here it is here we are all collecting uh, little bits of bone within about an hour of when this site was found and we found later that day that the bones were actually coming out here so we did a little bit of an excavation that year. We pulled out a few specimens. We came back in 2017 and cleaned all of the bones out in about nine days. And what we found was pretty remarkable. We had a new species of long-necked reptile that's distantly related to dinosaurs. We had amphibian pieces. These amphibians had heads that looked like toilet seats that were a little bit bigger than toilet seats. We had 
what Ken really likes, synapsids. Uh, this dicynodont skull is about this big. And this dicynodont skull and part of its body was crushed down on this animal right here, a long-necked reptile. Now, when I saw these bones in the field, I had a, a memory flash of something I saw in a museum in London. In the 1930s, British scientists collected fossils from the same area. We didn't know exactly how close, though. They were looking for early dinosaur relatives. They were looking for other reptiles. They were looking for dicynodonts. And they collected this specimen. There's a bit more of it than just these vertebrae. But they found much of a skeleton of a reptile that has been sitting in that museum for over 65 years and it had never been studied or named. And when I looked really closely at the label and figured out what some of these terms meant in terms of where it was located, it turned out it was within about a quarter of a mile of where we found our specimens. So maybe they were found at the exact same place. We will never know, unfortunately, because the dot of where the specimen came from had a radius of about a mile. So we were close though, and we knew we were about the same age. So when we took all those bones from London and all the bones we found, we reconstructed this animal. This is an animal we named Teleocrater in about 2017, and it's one of those close relatives of dinosaurs only because it has a certain number of dinosaur features. But if you look at its body, it doesn't really look like a dinosaur. It looks like mo more like a monitor lizard or a crocodile on stilts. But what we see is that depression on the top of the head that you only see in dinosaurs, but you have a crocodile-like ankle, which crocodiles still have today, so it doesn't have that bird joint yet. But we see a reduction in that joint Going towards that bird-like ankle, we see those characteristic specialty joints in the vertebrae, and we see some of those dinosaur features in the upper leg bone. So clearly this wasn't a dinosaur, but it told us that a lot of these things that we said, oh, this is definitely a dinosaur, a lot of these features actually showed up in their closest relatives, so dinosaurs inherited them. So fast forward from 2000, to 2018, this is our new family tree of dinosaurs. Here are three groups of dinosaurs. And what we've done is filled out these groups. So we've got aphanosaurs and lagerpetids and silosaurs, where this only occupied two species in 2002, maybe three species. We have uh, seven or eight, maybe even 10 species in this group. We have about six species in this group, and we have five species in this group. So not only are we finding those close relatives, but we're finding out that they exploded in diversity and some of them lived with dinosaurs. And when we look at this geographically, they completely overlap with dinosaurs. So our prediction that these animals could get everywhere because it was the time of Panchia was completely right. That these animals were living with dinosaurs. At the end of the Triassic though, all these close relatives die dinosaurs take over the world. So I've been studying these animals for about 10 years now, and there's another decade of research to be done, but I wanted to share some of the implications of these animals. First, here's our family tree. And remember, dinosaurs are this group here, and all those characteristics that you find in Jurassic dinosaurs that are unique at that time aren't unique in the Triassic. It turns out that they evolved as you get closer and closer to dinosaurs. And that dinosaurs actually share very few characters that unite this entire group. It's only clear after all of these animals die that dinosaurs become unique. We also see some unexpected results, and I call these parallel trends. So dinosaurs were changing their hind limb, they were elongating their hind limb, but dinosaurs weren't the only ones to do it. Their closest relatives were actually doing this too. This is a foot of a Coelisaurus, and a Coelisaurus actually has a pretty short foot. And if you look downstairs, most of the dinosaurs down there have really long feet. And you have a tendency 
to lose the outer digits or at least reduce them so they're walking on three toes. If you've ever looked at a turkey foot or a bird foot, it's just three toes today. What we see is independent reductions of their feet to three, uh, three toes or even two toes again and again. But the common ancestor of all these different groups had five toes. So you see this again and again, and it's not just the foot. There's parts of the skeleton that are evolving in parallel within these groups. So dinosaurs weren't actually doing too much unique. They were just the survivors. So what is left? In the Triassic, at least, there are very few characters that help us identify dinosaurs. You have elongated hands and big raptorial claws. We think these are unique to dinosaurs, but we still don't have a lot of the fossils of their closest relatives. Their femur, or their upper leg bone, has a number of features that are only found in dinosaurs. But the best feature of telling if you have a dinosaur in the Triassic, Jurassic, Cretaceous, Cenozoic, is the open hip socket, or open acetabulum. This is something that seems to be conserved and evolved only in dinosaurs. And this is really great because if you're a teacher, you can point to any chicken, any turkey, and show that open acetabulum or open hip socket to show that that feature evolved from their dinosaur ancestors. So just wrapping it up in a few seconds, but I wanted to show you guys this line right here is the end Triassic Jurassic boundary. So if you're in the Chinle Formation, which is late Triassic, with some of the earliest dinosaurs, fossils in this formation, which is spread across all over the western U.S., are actually hard to figure out if you have a dinosaur or not, especially given all the convergence that we see with other groups, but also all these early dinosaur cousins live with early dinosaurs. So even if you have a partial skeleton, sometimes you don't know if you have a dinosaur or a close relative of dinosaurs. Whereas after the end Triassic extinction, where a lot of those groups disappear, and you get into, let's say, the Kanta formation, which is early Jurassic, pretty much anything big that you find that has one dinosaur character is a dinosaur. So this extinction, winnowed out the closest relatives and all these other big competitors for dinosaurs. So when you find big animals in the Jurassic, you could be pretty assured that they are dinosaurs. So just a couple conclusions, things I want to leave you guys with, is that dinosaur relatives were actually much more common and diverse than we ever thought. They were doing their own thing. They were evolving beaks. They were evolving dinosaur-like characters independently. There are few unique dinosaur characters, but that open hip socket seems to be one of those classic characters that finally still works today. And dinosaurs are easy to identify in the Jur Jurassic and Cretaceous because all their close relatives are dead. So it's easy to figure out that you have a dinosaur after this big extinction. Thank you very much. <laughs>